As a homeschooling mom of eight children, I spend a lot of time in the kitchen. Some meals are those fast, easy ones to throw together whenever we have a busy schedule, and some are the ones that I enjoy taking a little more time to prep. I wanna invite you to join me in my kitchen as I share a mixture of both. This is the first time in a long time that we've grown eggplant in the garden. Luke was in charge of the garden this year. I really neglected it, but this was the first year that he was really into it. So it kind of worked out because I was less into it. He was more into it. That means that our garden was still planted. And one of the things that he planted was eggplant. We've pulled in quite a few and I don't know a lot of ways to prepare it. I've seen some people grill it, I've seen a few other recipes, but of course, the one that you think of when you think of eggplant, this is for someone who doesn't prepare a whole lot of it, is eggplant parmesan. So I looked up some recipes online and I found one where she recommended the best way to do it is to slice it and then salt it, allow it to sit and sweat so that a lot of the moisture isn't in there so you could keep it nice and crispy whenever frying it. I know there's oven baked ways and lots of ways to do it, but I just wanted to do a very classic eggplant parmesan. So I sliced it and salted it so that I could let it sweat. And then now I'm gonna make some mozzarella cheese. Now what I'm doing right now is adding citric acid to one jar of water, it's a little quarter cup of water, and then some rennet to another. That helps it to incorporate better into the milk. But lately I've been skipping that step altogether. I have made so many batches of mozzarella cheese where I simply stir in the citric acid, bring it up to 100 degrees, add the rennet, let it sit and then I just stir it. I don't separate the curds from the whey, stretch it on the back of a spoon. It's a really fast way. Yesterday we wanted pizza and I had a whole bunch of sourdough started to make my sourdough pizza crust that just goes straight onto the skillet, a whole bunch of milk and I did it the lazy way and we had the idea to the pizzas all in less than an hour and so that's my kind of cooking. Usually I try to get really comfortable with a recipe for a while, doing it the total right way. And then after I've tried it several times, I'll cut a step here, cut a step there until I have it down to, this is the bare minimum you have to do in order to have a decent final product. Not perfect, but decent. And that's what I've done with mozzarella and I've gotten it very streamlined. I'm also mixing up some eggs and milk. Again, I followed a recipe online, but I feel like there was way too many eggs. I really think you only needed just a little bit of eggs and milk, maybe one egg, because not very much actually sticks to the eggplant parmesan. I'm also doing sourdough breadcrumbs. I do this all the time. I like to keep them on hand. They're good for a lot of things. Frying is one of my favorite things to do with them. So basically I take a loaf of sourdough bread, the one that I'm cutting up in this video was frozen because we had that photo shoot I told you about in my last video for the sourdough book. So I had all these loaves of bread frozen and I turned these into breadcrumbs. So I cut it up, toasted it in the oven, and then once they were nice and hard and crispy, blended them in the blender and then put them in a little shallow dish in order to dip the eggplant pieces once they were nice and dry, even towel them off a little bit with a paper towel, in the eggs and then into the breadcrumbs that I also had mixed with a little bit of salt and Italian seasoning. And I'll just keep the remaining breadcrumbs, not the ones of course that had egg dipped in them, but the ones I didn't pour into this plate in a quart size mason jar out on my counter. If I plan to keep them for longer term, like I don't have any plans to use breadcrumbs in the next couple weeks, I'll put them in the fridge to keep them longer but they last a really long time. I find that with sourdough bread, because it's been fermented, it sometimes does last a little bit longer, especially once it's cooked and toasty and dry. I've kept sourdough bread crumbs for a couple weeks. To finish off this eggplant Parmesan, I'm adding some homemade sauce. We have a lot of that right now because of the tomatoes in the garden. It's just the easiest way to cook them down. When they're really hot, I put them in a jar and then they seal, but I plan to use them pretty soon so I'm not like water bath canning them but I put them in the fridge and treat it not quite like a can jar that can just last forever but also I know they can last a little bit longer whenever they seal like that. Then I'm layering it with my homemade mozzarella, some parmesan and then just making several layers like lasagna and I'm gonna serve it with pasta and more pasta sauce. Out in the garden I'm grabbing basil. While I'm out there I snip a few roses. I have been doing this lately where 
I bring herbs in and put them in water so that I don't have to go out to the garden every single time I want herbs. This keeps them fresh and allows them to last a lot longer. So they don't just go bad the second they sit on the counter for, you know, 10, 15 minutes, they start to wilt. They last a lot longer whenever you put them in the water. I mean, I know that's so obvious, but for whatever reason, I don't normally do that unless I'm making an arrangement with flowers where I use the herbs as the greenery. Now I'm just bringing in extra handfuls and stashing them directly in water. All right, taking a break from sharing our family meals to tell you about today's video sponsor, Thrive Market. Thrive Market is a membership-based online grocery store that has organic, natural products, a lot of things that if you live in a rural environment, you might struggle to find locally. Even if you don't, a lot of the stores that I go to and try to get some specialty ingredients are quite expensive and Thrive Market really solves that problem of being able to find organic things like einkorn flour, spices, pasta, pantry staples, condiments. There are so many things that I regularly purchase on Thrive Market and have for many years. With Thrive Market, you have the option to pay month to month at $12 a month so you can try it out, see if there's some things on there that you purchase regularly and can maybe find for a better price on Thrive Market or things that you can't seem to find locally but you really want to stock in your pantry or you can pay for the year. This is what I have always done for $5 a month. So quite a savings there, billed at $59.95 for the year. So if you pay all at once, you get a discount. I love that on the Thrive Market website, you can sort by your dietary preference. So if you are paleo, gluten-free, dairy-free, you can make it to where only those things show up. Also, Thrive Market offers orders over $49 to ship for free. So that's Really convenient, everything comes right to your door. Thrive Market is offering Farmhouse on Boone viewers 30% off your first order plus a free gift worth up to $60 by using my link, thrivemarket.com forward slash Farmhouse on Boone. It'll also be linked in the description box below. Again, thank you so much to Thrive Market for sponsoring today's video and make sure to go take advantage of that awesome deal. All right, back out to the garden to gather some more things for the next meal. I am gathering up some tomatoes and peppers. We have a variety of peppers this year and I don't really know exactly what we planted. Nobody kept record of that, but I have found ways to use them. So some of them are spicy, some of them are just bell peppers. I can get away with putting some of the spicy ones in small amounts into the food for the kids. A lot of my kids actually really like spice. I only have a few that are wildly against them. Actually, I have just basically one that cannot stand spice. But for the most part, I can use those. And of course, bell peppers, those have been so nice for a lot of stuffed peppers. We just made those a few days ago, so good. I'm gathering up a few seasonings, chili powder, cumin, paprika, garlic powder, salt, in order to season this up. So I'm gonna be doing a sheet pan fajita meal. This is just to make dinner really easy. I'm going to put everything on a sheet pan, allow that to bake, and then later take it all and serve it with some tortillas and whatnot. So I'm cutting up some chicken. I've been using a lot of chicken breast. I get this from my sister's farm. She does actually ship now, so you can check her out at newhartfordfarmco.com. There is chicken, beef, pork, for those of you who are local-ish, so if you're in Missouri or if you're willing to drive or you're in the Midwest, you can also come pick up a half a beef, which is what I do. And then I buy the chicken just whenever I'm at my parents' house because my sister lives close to my parents and she stores her chicken there in a massive industrial type, I don't know if industrial is the right word, that might be overkill. I don't know. It's a big walk-in freezer that she keeps there. I will just stock up on chicken. All summer, I've been doing a lot of chicken breasts just because they're so easy to thaw, easy to cook. I don't have to turn the oven on very long. I have just really been liking it as much as I like whole chickens, especially when you have a whole chicken, you get the bones for bone broth, which is really nice, especially all fall whenever I need a constant supply of broth for soups and whatnot. But in the summer, I have really been falling back on the easiness of, or the ease, of chicken breasts and it's been nice resource just to go shopping at my parents house of course that's fabulous i'm going to be making a homemade salsa with this we've been doing homemade salsa with so many things because it's another easy way to use up tomatoes although i have canned some i have freeze-dried some 
I really prefer just to consume as many as we possibly can fresh and then not have to store it. I know that that's probably sounds very modern day convenience of me as opposed to back in the day when, you know, if you didn't save enough tomatoes, you weren't going to have tomatoes all winter. I am thankful to live in 2023. So because of that, we are consuming so many fresh, but then also making tons into sauces, canning, freeze drying, and salsa is one of the best. So I'm adding some jalapenos. I know what those are, but then we also have some what I thought were banana peppers, but they're a little spicy. They're really delicious. We grew a lot of onions. So I'm just going to dice up all of those fresh things, add some lime juice, salt, garlic powder, and serve that alongside my sheet pan fajitas. I am currently out of my good corn tortillas that I usually order in bulk. I tried some from a different source recently and I did not like them. They were just really hard. So I need to go back to my La Tortilla factory ones. These are just, you know, these are just not organic or whatever. So I'm pretty sure that probably means they're GMO, right? I don't know. It's not my preference, but I like corn tortillas. I like having them on hand. They're the one way that I can get my kids to eat eggs for dinner. We're getting so many eggs right now. And one way that they'll tolerate eggs for breakfast and dinner all in the same day is whenever I put them in a buttered, grilled, like on the stovetop with butter, corn tortilla with eggs and cheese. I'm very excited to share with you this next meal because it features my newest favorite move in the kitchen, especially for fall. It's still summer, it's still hot, and this will be much better in the fall. That is my sourdough, oh my word, baby noises here. <laughs> sourdough puff pastry made into some kind of pie. And yes, the baby fusses in the kitchen and that just means that it, I have to pull away for a little bit, readjust things, put the passy back in, rock and pat them, possibly take a break to nurse. That is just how life changes with a newborn. Anyways, back to my puff pastry. I want to have this on hand at all times. I talked about this in a recent video because it's a really fast way to pull together a meal that looks and tastes impressive. Flaky layers, it impresses the children. You can fill it with all sorts of different things. So whether it's chicken pot pie, or like in today's case, I'm doing a beef pie. Some friends of mine that I met through a homeschool group actually brought me a few meals whenever I had Victor and they did it shepherd's pie style with lamb and she made her own puff pastry. So there's been a lot of influences as to how this is now becoming a staple in my kitchen and I hope I can pass it on to you because it really isn't so enjoyable to have. So for the filling for this, I'm doing ground beef. I don't yet have a great lamb source or at least I know I can find one because I actually have seen a local farm that does it. I'm just not sure. Like I've never, in our, our culture, we just don't do a whole lot of lamb, but the way that they prepared it was so good that I'm like, I need to start keeping that in the rotation of meals. Today I'm just doing ground beef again from New Hartford Farm Co. Celery, diced onions, diced carrots, diced garlic, salt, a little Worcestershire. Now the recipe calls for tomato paste, but lately I have been using my freeze dried tomatoes in the place of tomato paste. I also did this in my stuffed peppers I did recently. I took the freeze dried tomatoes and just put it directly in with the beef and you can get away with using quite a bit of it and it so sort of soaks up the grease and the liquid in the recipe, makes it thicker like a tomato paste would and it's a really good way to use up freeze dried tomatoes. I put these sliced up on my freeze dryer trays. After they freeze dried, I just crush them up with my hands. I think going back, I would blend all the tomatoes first, pour them into the trays, and then freeze dry them from liquid as opposed, or you know, blended up liquid as opposed to slices. That would work a lot better. Either way, it makes a really great tomato paste. I'm also adding in some potatoes from our garden, some spices to taste. Now, if only I could remember what all those were. Probably Italian seasoning or Herbs de Provence, salt, pepper, garlic powder, uh, onion powder, those usual ones that I reach for. This isn't like a Mexican dish, so it's not 
cumin or anything like that. But basically I'm just trying to create a filling that's really tasty that can go inside my puff pastry. Whatever combination that might be, a lot of different ways would work. Usually whenever I'm doing something like this, I will taste it along the way just to see how it's tasting, if it's salty enough. You wanna always be sure to add plenty of salt. And then I have some parsley in my front landscaping. Whenever I grabbed some parsley from the nursery, I believe it was already a little plant, I didn't have any more spots in my garden for it because my sage basically overtook my herb garden. So I just threw it in the front landscaping. It's gotten huge and it's really convenient. In fact, all of my herbs should be right in my front landscaping. I'd probably use them way more if they were. I also picked up a little bit of sage and thyme out in the main garden and grabbed a little bit of extra of each of it to add next to my little basil rose area. This not only keeps them fresh and usable for several days, but also looks beautiful. I dice up my combination of herbs, add it to my pie filling, if you will, as, along with some frozen peas. And then the next step is to get my puff pastry out of the fridge. If a lot of this sourdough stuff is confusing to you, I actually just launched a brand new course all about sourdough. So it has how to make your own starter, beginner loaves of bread, improving your understanding of all things sourdough. And it has my complete recipe book with 130 recipes. It's a digital version, not my real book just yet. And then it also has a Facebook community, which I'm really excited about, a place to ask questions with each other, other students in the class. So you can find my new course over at bit.ly forward slash farmhouse sourdough course. That's all lowercase bit.ly slash farmhouse sourdough course. So the cool thing about this puff pastry is it can sit in the fridge for a long time with great results. I was actually really surprised. So to my surprise, it works so well even after being in the fridge for over a week. So I've tried eight days. I would like to try even longer just to see like how long can this puff pastry sit in the fridge before it needs to be used. Of course it can also be frozen, but you have to thaw it out. So for me to have something that's ready to go, I can throw together a meal really quick with things I have around. It needs to be a refrigerated thing so that it doesn't have to wait to thaw. So this is just one recipe, not doubled. Instead of cutting it in half, maybe cut it in 60%, 40%. So that way you have enough to fill a nine by 13 in it to come out the outside edges. And then a smaller piece for the top. I just sort of folded them up and around the top piece with my fingers and then crimped it with a fork. I had some leftovers from the edges I trimmed and I was at this point holding Victor because he didn't want to be in the wrap anymore. So one-handed, I flattened out my little leftover tiny bit of puff pastry dough, added some chocolate chips to it, rolled it up and then put it in just a small bread pan is all I had for a small dish and put that in while the main pie was baking and I got mama a little sourdough chocolate croissant for dessert. So I might've hid that for myself and had that with a big glass of raw milk. I'm way too excited about this sourdough puff pastry, obviously. <laughs> there are just so many ways that you can use it. You can make little hand pies and then look at the flaky layers. Do you see that? They are so pretty and crispy and delicious and it's really not hard to make. Next up is pizza pockets. I think I still just prefer sourdough pizza, but every once in a while it's fun for the kids and just fun for the home cook to switch it up, you know, take something that you've done a lot in your life and make it just a little bit different. And that is what I did with these pizza pockets. So I took my sourdough pizza crust that it was in the freezer for a while and then it was in the fridge for a little bit thawing. And after a getting the baby into the wrap break, taking the dough and dividing it up into, I believe I did eight parts for one recipe of the sourdough pizza dough recipe. Now the first time or the first couple times I did this, I made the mistake of getting some parts too thin. You can sort of flatten it out after you fill it. So you, you roll it into a little circle and then add in mozzarella cheese or whatever you want to do. I'm doing some also with some goat cheese, but for the kids, I'm doing my homemade mozzarella, 
sausage and pizza sauce or just tomato sauce that I cooked down on the stove and then folding it in half. I found that if I got it too thin, it ripped open and it kind of got messy because the pasta sauce came out. If you make it not near as thin and it looks like it's not gonna work, but then after you push the edges down, sort of flatten it out with a roller or your hand, you can make it bigger even after it's filled, if that makes sense. I started doing that and it really worked well. I also did add some fresh basil since it's right here in the little pitcher to the sausage cheese, you know, regular, style pizza. Again, it's just so nice to not have to run to the garden every time I want basil. And then sometimes me and Luke, or pretty much every time I make pizza, I like to make us one with goat cheese, some kind of pork, whether it's bacon, prosciutto, salami, goat cheese, and chili date sauce. If you're not familiar with this, my friend Colleen from the company Date Lady, and I say my friend because I had her on my podcast, uh, she sent me the most lovely package after I had Victor full of date goods. So it's called Date Lady and they have date barbecue sauce. It's Instead of sugar, it's sweetened with all dates. Pizza. They have this date chili sauce, which is by far our favorite. We put it on a lot of things. Dates, of course, date sugar, just all of these date products. They also threw in a onesie that said date baby for Victor. But we always have this date stuff and pizza is our favorite way to use it. After baking the pizzas, I brushed them with butter and they were so good. They're really good on the go too. Once they're cool and you can handle them, you can take them on the go. You could add sandwich fillings. You could really experiment. There's a lot that you can do with that recipe. Okay, for this meal, we're moving on to something that is really easy, really hands off, something we fall back to in our kitchen a lot. And that is taco salads, or it's just what we call them really. You can do a lot of different combinations based on things that you have. My first step today is I'm going to cook up some rice. We don't always do rice with taco salads, but it's a nice filling carb to add alongside a dish to make it stretch a little further. Last time I ordered half a beef from my sister's farm. Whenever I talk to the processor, which is what you do whenever you buy a beef or pork, you will call the processing place and they'll walk you through all of the cuts and how thick you want them and how much you want into ground beef or if you want round steaks. There's a lot of ways that you can do it. And this last time I put a lot of it into ground beef, way more than I probably even should have because a lot of those cuts are great. But I find that in my kitchen, other than steaks, we really like steaks, we really like roast. Ground beef is the most versatile thing and I like to have a lot of it because if I forget to thaw meat out, ground beef is something that first I can put it in hot water in a large bowl, let it do an initial thaw that way for a few minutes or you know, 15, 20 minutes. Then I can put it in a skillet with some water and a lid on it. So my large lid that goes with my stainless set fits onto my large cast iron skillet. So I'll take a two pound frozen meat, maybe a quick initial water thaw, put it into that cast iron skillet, add some water, put the lid on, turn it on high. The water is what keeps it from burning to the bottom. Walk away and it is thawed really fast. So I just like having ground meats on hand, whether they're the best tasting, you know, that that's obviously arguable. It's, it, they're really not. It's so nice knowing that even when I forget to plan ahead, which I try really hard not to, but there are times whenever I realize it's dinner time, we have no meat thawed out, I can thaw it so fast. Now, of course, if you have a microwave, you can do it that way too, but we don't have a microwave. This way works really well. Ground meat is the best for it. I am shredding up some store-bought cheese. I have not been brave enough since getting into my last wheel of cheese to open another one until yesterday. I finally did it. So if you've followed along with the whole making cheese thing, I've been making wheels of cheese. So other than just mozzarella, I've been making wheels, aging them. I have had about 50% success. Now nothing has gone bad. Like you can get your cheese contaminated and get really sick. Nothing like that but taste has been about 50 50 and i think i finally know my problem i think i've had a bad vacuum sealer and so it'll not be fully sealed i'll go out to my little cheese refrigerator where it's aging and see that one isn't sealed i'll bring it in reseal it and then 
every once in a while or every other wheel, it doesn't taste good. And so I think what's happening is it's getting somewhat sour with the condensation of it not being sealed. Anyways, I have my theories. Finally, yesterday we opened a Gouda that was seasoned with cumin. And whenever we opened it, I first had Luke cut into it. And I wanted to see if there were any holes that would suggest contamination. I didn't see that. And then I smelled it and it smelled like the good cheese that we've had. So I think I had my vacuum sealer work really well on that one. It was one that never lost the seal and it tasted so good and it was so good in our stuffed peppers. So I think I finally, now that I know what has gone wrong, I think I'm brave enough to try it again but I was getting a little bit discouraged on the fact that everything went right and then the taste was bad. Up until now, feeling like I actually know the cause and the reason behind it, I feel like I can go forward and continue to make cheese. It's a learning curve for sure, but I do feel so proud whenever we open cheese that I made months ago from the milk that we milked from our cow and I get this wonderful smell and taste then I think, okay, I can definitely try this again. For those taco salads, we did some more homemade salsa, corn tortilla chips, arugula, sour cream, fermented peppers and sauerkraut, cheese, of course, and called it a day. Now I am moving on to the final meal I'm gonna share with you. And that is something from the blog that I wanted to retest in grams for my sourdough cookbook. It's a savory, almost like a cinnamon roll, but a savory, cheesy herb version. Because it's not really a full meal, these rolls, they're more just like a side dish. Now a little more than a side dish because they have the cheese in them, but they don't stand alone. I'm also doing a chicken, a creamy chicken, just kind of improvising on this. For the herb and cheese roll dough, I made that last night, let it sit all night, it rose, and then today, I added in the baking soda, the baking powder, and mix that up in my mixer. Putting that aside while I caramelize some onions and work on the chicken. For the chicken, I'm adding color by heating up some butter really hot in a cast iron skillet, getting some nice color on both sides, adding a little salt and pepper, as well as garlic powder, onion powder for flavor. This is how I start most chicken. I like to get the skillet really hot, cook it on both sides, add some seasoning, and then usually I will create some kind of sauce and finish it off in the oven to make it nice and tender. Meanwhile, the onions keep cooking on the other burner. It's on about medium to low heat. I don't wanna burn them. And to not burn them, I also occasionally add water if I feel like they're starting to burn. So lots of butter, but then also water to keep caramelizing them and cooking them without them sticking and burning and getting crispy. So I'm removing the chicken, deglazing it with a bit of wine. I also pulled from the pantry more of that freeze-dried tomato stuff that I'm using as tomato paste, and then gathering some cream from the refrigerator. I'm gonna do like a tomato cream sauce, which I do on here in various ways all the time just because I love it so much. So to the pan that I cooked the chicken in and then deglaze with the wine, I'm adding quite a bit of cream. I will then salt it, add my freeze-dried tomatoes, and then usually I'll add in a little bit of flour, continue to cook it on low-ish until it gets nice and thick. The purpose for the flour is to thicken it up. I don't want it totally runny so that whenever you're eating chicken, it's just sitting in almost like a soup. I want it to be able to coat the back of a spoon so that it can coat the chicken and be really easy to eat. We have so much cream right now. Well, not really enough to make butter, but we have plenty of cream for purposes like this and it makes a decadent sauce that you can add in whatever you have. So this tastes really good, of course, with some fresh herbs. For today, I'm gonna be using fresh sage. I also make sure whatever drippings came off the chicken go back into the pot because those are really delicious. Then I'm gonna put the whole thing in the oven until it is tender and cooked through. I don't really measure time, I just check it. If you overcook chicken, it can get really dry, so you don't wanna do that. But whenever you're cooking it in a creamy sauce or any kind of sauce, it will tend to not dry out. So if you're having trouble with cooking chicken enough so that you're comfortable eating it, but then also feel like it's always really dry, cooking it in a sauce leaves some room for error and it is really tender and delicious. Okay, I'm rolling out my dough 
that fermented all night and then I added in a few more leaveners so I don't have to wait for this to rise in the form of baking soda and baking powder. This recipe is over on the blog. Roll it out, add cheddar cheese, caramelized onions, whatever herbs you have. Today I'm using, what all did I use? Sage, thyme, rosemary. Yeah, rosemary is really good in this. Oh, I forgot to mention that before all of that, I spread it with one stick or half a cup of softened butter. Add in all those toppings and then I'm gonna cut it up just like a normal cinnamon roll. So for this one, I'll be doing 12 equal parts. It can be a little bit tricky to keep all of those ingredients inside while you transfer it to your baking dish, but it's totally doable. You could experiment with this, so add in some cooked bacon. If you have a different kind of cheese, you can do that, or say you're trying to use up a whole bunch of peppers from the garden. Whatever it is, you can roll it up in this dough and make a savory roll that is really good. We had a few of these left over and Luke started taking it out of the fridge, cutting them down the middle and then toasting them like bread and eating them with eggs in the morning, which I thought was a genius idea. It was really good. On this particular day, they were a very nice side and the chicken was so tender. We also served this with a bit of sauerkraut as a fresh element with the meal. Thank you so much for stopping by our farmhouse kitchen. I hope I gave you some inspiration for your own family.